And we're now going to, I'm going to uh, talk for a while now um, on a topic around consultation skills and not prescribing antibiotics. We talked earlier on, um, Louise was mentioning the idea that there were things that we didn't need to do. We all know about over-prescribing of antibiotics. Um, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. Now, I'm interested in the people in the audience here. We have, I know, a few GPs. Can we have some hands? for GPs. Obviously, this is a problem for us. We've got a large number of, I think, nurses and nurse practitioners. How many of you prescribe antibiotics or prescribers and are in a position to be prescribing or not antibiotics? We have got, I think, paramedics. Now, what's your role in prescribing? Do you, you perhaps don't actually prescribe, but you probably refer back to somebody who can. You use PG, so you can actually prescribe antibiotics. So this is clearly relevant for you. Any other professionals? We've got physiotherapists, I think. Do you get involved with prescribing? Not, not that we would go back to the GP. But you go back and the GP who is busy says, yep, that's fine. So actually you are prescribing via somebody else's fountain pen. Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> physio but I think what's um, important in my head is that patients who already have antibiotics at home it's when to encourage them and right now is the time. Okay. So that's the COPD um, prescribing. I'm not actually going to particularly touch on that but some really interesting information to suggest we're over prescribing in that group as well as the people I'm going to talk about. Yeah, I'm an independent prescribing pharmacist so we're looking at doing rescue packs for COPD. So you're a pharmacist and you're involved with obviously influencing prescribing. So what I'm going to do really is talk about strategies, techniques, ways of avoiding a prescription that you know isn't needed. So avoiding unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions because we know that there are circumstances when they are very necessary. So that's my remit. And I want to do three things. I want to start by talking about how do you recognize that recognizing normality, when don't you need to prescribe? I want to talk a bit about the misconceptions around the risk the risk of not prescribing, or indeed the risk of taking an antibiotic, um, and then some practical consultation skills that I found helpful um, and that I hope you may find helpful. So let's have a couple of case studies because these are real people, I think, to you. <clears throat> this is Luke. Luke is a boy of three and he's got a cough. Now the story from mum is that it started last autumn, he coughs all day, his parents are awake all night while he coughs. He ne isn't necessarily awake, incidentally. Um, it's the parents who are awake. He's had five courses of antibiotics this winter so far, and he's still coughing. He's got an intermittently snotty nose, but he's otherwise a healthy, lively lad. Does he sound familiar? You've all seen Luke's many times. OK, so you have a choice of five options. Um, you could give him another antibiotic could recommend a cough medicine, give him an inhaler, tell him it's normal, or obviously you could give his, oops, how do I go back up on that? <coughs> you can give his parents some sleeping tablets. Let's have a vote. Who wants to give him another antibiotic? Who thinks they might give him another antibiotic if they're running short of time and the parents are particularly pushy? Come on, be honest. <laughs> it's not unheard of. Who thinks a cough medicine might be a good option? He can buy that himself or parents can. Cough medicine, anybody? Okay, who would think an inhaler's worth thinking about? Yep, few of you are interested in inhalers. Um, who's, who's going to reassure him or his parents that it's normal? Yes, I am, if I possibly can. But I see a bit of reticence with hands going up and I won't ask about the sleeping tablets. <laughs> But you see the problem, it's a real problem, isn't it? Coughs in children are divided into various categories. These are the two smaller categories. You'll see the big category come up in a minute. 
Um, Non-specific coughs and specific coughs. The specific coughs are the red flags we're all looking for. So even in Luke, we need to be thinking about things like cystic fibrosis. We want to be thinking about some of heart failure, you know, the congenital heart disease that hasn't been picked up. We hear a lot about reflux. I'm not entirely convinced about that one. Um, but there are things, inhaled foreign bodies. We don't want to miss that. Shall I tell you the story of my last inhaled foreign body that I saw in a Luke-sized patient? She was a little bit, a little bit younger than Luke, but he, this child had started coughing um, and had been three months of coughing, been fine really before that. Somebody tried an inhaler because there was some asthma in the family, so that was tried and that made no difference at all. Eventually, the story came out, or more accurately, the chocolate drop came out he coughed up a chocolate drop. And what had happened was he'd been given his immunization and he'd been very good. Um, and the nurse had very kindly given him a chocolate drop. I hope you don't do this because what he'd done in screaming <gasps> was to inhale the chocolate drop. Um, once he coughed it up and it had gone, the problem went away. I mention it because everybody was there watching this event happen, but nobody realized what had happened. We don't always get a good story of inhaled foreign bodies. So do think about these sort of things. Things to watch are early on, the very small child, the child that's coughing from birth or coughing from very young childhood, um, a wet cough as opposed to the dry cough, feeding difficulties, all these sorts of things would immediately raise your suspicions. And then there's these causes of cough that we look for, usually an isolated cough. Asthma was mentioned. Yes, of course, children with asthma cough. But actually, if you've got asthma as a cause of your cough, at some point you are going to wheeze. Cough by itself as a symptom of asthma is really quite uncommon. It's cough and at some point, perhaps variably, asthma is a variable condition, there will be some wheeze to go with it. So if you've got a child with just cough, think very carefully, is this really asthma? And particularly if they don't respond to, to, to treatment. Postnasal drip is still up for debate as to whether that is a cause of cough, whether it's the postnasal drip bit that's the problem, or whether it's just some inflammation going on a bit lower down as well as the postnasal drip. Um, reflux, as I say, there are people who believe that reflux, when my babies were young, they posited, as I recall. Now they have reflux. Whether that is a cause of um, a cough is a fairly doubtful. It is in adults, but whether it is in children, if you treat um, reflux in, in babies, it doesn't seem to change the cough. So it's out for grabs. Environmental tobacco smoke is definitely a cause of cough in children and parental smoking, passive smoking for children is a hugely important one to consider. What I wanted to talk about was the normal cough or the expected cough. Normal children cough. These are cough counts, children who were wearing a cough counter. Um, they are normal children. They have got no symptoms. Parents are completely happy about them. These are normal children's cough. Um, and as you can see, the cough count is something between one and 34 coughing episodes a day in a normal child. So normal children cough. And parental reporting is very unreliable. It depends upon the perceptions of the parents rather more than it does the severity of the cough. So parent, parents' reporting of coughing is very unreliable. When you actually record it, it bears no resemblance. Now, here's another story. This is the recovery from a cough after you've had a cold. OK, so at the beginning, everybody has got a cough and that line is the recovery over a month of the children, the proportion who've recovered. So in fact, by two weeks, there's 25% of children are still coughing. Two weeks after starting a cold. 10% are still coughing a month after a cold. That is the duration of resolution of cough, longer than parents expect, and I think longer than many of us expect. If you add to that, that children, young children, I'm talking Luke now, 
are, can be expected to get between five and 10 colds a year. If you multiply that by the duration of the cough, inevitably Luke is going to be coughing for most of the winter months of the year. Coughing children are normal. Now let's talk about John. John is a man with a cough. He had a cold about 10 days ago. He's come in to see you because he's got a chesty cough, by which he means he's got some phlegm. Um, he's a non-smoker. He's got blood pressure, but he's otherwise very fit and well. He's off on holiday at the weekend and he'd really like you to stop his cough before then, please. Familiar? Yeah, okay. So here are your options. Who wants to give him an antibiotic? He is going on holiday, remember? It's interesting, isn't it, that even people who will say at one time, I know antibiotics won't help me, but I am going on holiday. <laughs> Implication being that when you're on holiday, antibiotics work. OK, so who wants to give him an antibiotic? He is going on holiday. No, you wouldn't dare, would you? Explain why an antibiotic won't help. He, he is bigger than you, remember? Okay. Explain it's normal, and that's something we're going to talk a bit more about. Who wants to arrange a chest x-ray? If he coughed for one more week, he'd be coming into that advert that says if you've been coughing for more than three weeks, wouldn't he? Who wants a chest x-ray? Nobody. Good, because actually he's a non-smoker. What's his risk at this point? Pretty small. If he's still coughing in another two to three weeks, we might want to. Otherwise, of course, he could cancel his holiday. The question in your mind, actually, isn't really about does he need an antibiotic? It's really, the bottom line is, has he got pneumonia? That's the real question, isn't it, that we worry about. This is a pyramid of people, a million people with chesty symptoms in the community, of whom about a third will consult, I've put a GP there because that's what the paper said, but of course it could be any of you. And of those, 990,000 nine, nine will be given an antibiotic. Of those, this million, 5,000 will actually have something on an x-ray that looks like pneumonia. Of whom about 250 out of a million will end up being admitted um, and a few will end up in intensive care and a very few will die. Okay, so what we're looking for here is a needle in a haystack. And that is the challenge of primary care. We've got a million people of whom we are looking for the one or two at major risk and that's our challenge. So how do we know whether someone's got pneumonia? This was a study that was done nearly 2,000 adults with a cough of whom 2%, just over 2.5% had community acquired pneumonia on a chest x-ray and what were the clues that helped them most? Well one was a high temperature, that's slightly helpful but you know, not that high, is it? 37.8. And you're going to find a few of those just with a cold. Raised respiratory rate is helpful. How many of us actually check respiratory rates? I'm getting a few nods there. Um, absence of a cold, I find that one really helpful. If they haven't got nasal symptoms and they've got a raised respiratory rate and a fever and a cough, that is helpful. Um, focal chest signs, if you hear something in the chest, that's helpful. If you don't, it doesn't tell you there isn't anything wrong. The chest just echoes around and you can hear normal breath sounds despite pneumonia. So if you hear something, it's important. And then, of course, there are the high-risk groups, the elderly, um, particularly the institutionalised and those with um, comorbidity. And that, of course, is where the COPD and the heart failure come in. Is that helpful? Absence of a cold, high temperature, raised respiratory rate, and focal signs if you find them, and remember the high-risk groups. And of course, if they do have pneumonia, they seriously need antibiotics, and they need them now. Um, you're familiar with this, are you? The severity <coughs> assessment for pneumonia, um, confusion, respiratory rate, blood pressure, low blood pressure, um, and um, what is they are pleased to call elderly here, over 65. One has to be careful with definitions of elderly. Um, and of course the score, if basically you scored on none of those, then your chances of dying you're in, you're very unlikely to get into trouble. If you are if score three to four, then you're considerably more likely and you're likely to need admission. And then in between we have to make a decision. 
A couple of other things that may help. Urea comes into that if you're in hospital, but of course is not so much use to us in primary care. Um, but two things, oxygen sats, who's got an oximeter immediately available for all their consultations these days? Really helpful piece of kit. Um, who's got CRP testing? Point of care testing, you have. Do you find it useful? Yes, I'm going to talk a bit about CRP testing in a moment. Um, heart, raised CRP is a very useful test. So, how do you recover from a chesty cough, chesty symptoms? This is a big study, the GRACE study, that was done around Europe. Um, and basically, this is plotting the duration, the, the recovery from a cold. So, people were recruited in primary care in a number of um, cities around Europe and basically they were plotting the recovery of the symptoms. Now what's interesting, well there are several things that are interesting on this, three, three and a half thousand adults with a chesty symptom and basically the starting score is very different. So why it is that people in um, Cardiff have far more higher symptom scores than people in a Hungarian city that I'm not going to try and pronounce, um, but they actually starting severity scores much higher in Cardiff, don't know why, but the recovery is similar fall off, but of course if you start with a higher score it takes a bit longer to recover. But look, it's something like two to three weeks before you have recovered from this chesty coughing symptom, wherever you live in Europe. Um, and this is the risk, I've called it a risk of being, of being given an antibiotic, which varies hugely um, from Tromso, where they very rarely use um, antibiotics, compared to um, Bratislava and Milan, where you are very likely to get an antibiotic. The UK is somewhere in the middle. But of course, Tromso will almost certainly be testing for CRP, because the Scandinavian countries are doing that as point of care testing very routinely. So... Quite a lot of patients were given, nearly half were overall, were given an antibiotic. Um, and did it make any difference? Well, statistically, they were able to show a difference. Um, I say that, they had 3,500 patients. Just imagine the statistical power of that. So yes, being prescribed an antibiotic did result in a faster resolution of symptom scores, but clinically it was a completely um, irrelevant difference the association was very small. That score, symptom score, was on a basis of 0 to 100. Okay, And the difference that they showed was a tenth of a one point difference. But because of the large numbers, they had the statistical power to show it. So yes, there was a difference, but it was completely irrelevant clinically, and indeed was entirely consistent with the placebo effect, was the conclusion of the authors. So the answer is no. Clinically, it made no difference of the people who were given antibiotics. And we know um, from, this is CPRD data, this is our primary care data that's used, the largest database of primary care patients, absolutely huge. Um, and they looked at the coding in our records. So the chances to, of a code of upper respiratory tract infection later being followed by a code of pneumonia, you had to treat four and, four and a half thousand people with an antibiotic to prevent that code appearing. So the number needed to treat was four and a half thousand. Similarly, the otitis media, in order to prevent the code of mastoiditis appearing, you had to treat 4,000 people, or children probably. Sore throat and quinsy, similar. So the number needed to treat is 4,000 or more. Um, in fact, with pneumonia, it's slightly less than that, and it's particularly in the older patient. So the NICE guidance, um, which I'm sure many of you have seen, divides people into three categories. The very unwell who seriously need an antibiotic. So they're the ones where you think they might have a pneumonia or one of the complications. They're at particular risk because of their comorbidity and the advancing age, particularly if they are institutionalized or have chronic conditions. Then in the middle, you've got a group where um, the young, very young child perhaps sick child you might want to give an antibiotic with bilateral otitis media, discharging ears, 
very difficult not to give antibiotics to, charge, to discharging ears in my experience. And these are the centre criteria. I'm going to come back to those for deciding if a sore throat will might benefit from an antibiotic. Um, then you've got everybody else where the advice is not to give antibiotics. Reassure and explain the natural history, remembering that that natural history is longer than you think it's going to be. Two to three weeks is nearer the mark. Delayed script, safety netting are important, and I'm going to come back to both of those. And the good news is that we are getting better. This is the reduction in antibiotic prescribing between 2005 uh, over the decade. So we are prescribing fewer antibiotics. The bad news is that the scale on that chart suggests that the drop is from about 55% to about 40, maybe 50 percent at the best. We've got a very long way to go before we actually get it to where we probably should have it. So the good news is we are getting better. The bad news is we've got a long way to go. So we all know that we're doing this badly. We're, we're getting this wrong. We know what we should be doing. And the question is, you know, why? Why is it wrong? This is, this is scary, actually. This is data from healthy volunteers who were given um, azithromycin or clarithromycin. And what we're seeing plotted here are the, is the um, antibiotic resistance, the macrolide resistant streptococci as a proportion of the swab, okay? So you've got at the bottom two lines, the placebo groups, and the top two are the ones that got the antibiotic. Just look how the antibiotic uh, resistance goes right up, soars. By day four, it's gone from 20% to over 80% resistant antibiotic, anti resistant bacteria as a result of taking the antibiotic. Now then you see that falling off and by six weeks, there's still a significant difference. And if you look at the one at the end, that's six months, they are still different. They're beginning to overlap. They're beginning to come back together again. So that course of antibiotics has altered the resistance in that person's, and these are normal, healthy people, it's altered the resistance in their streptococci for certainly six months. I think that's quite scary. So why are we doing it? And I want to, why do patients consult for these self-limiting illnesses and why do we prescribe? So why do they consult? Well, reassurance is actually one of the main reasons. These are qualitative data. <coughs> You'll, you'll recognise this. I was just expecting, not the doctor, not to prescribe anything really or say anything. I just wanted to give him a him, the child that is, a check over and make sure there wasn't anything on top of that. Just remember that. Because this was somebody who'd come in with a cold and a cough and they wanted to know if there was something on top of that. And I'll come back in a minute to what viruses are and infections are in people's minds. The second one, trouble is you don't know what's normal. You don't know how fast he's supposed to breathe. But when you hear him kind of breathing and he's all chesty, you don't know what's going on. You can understand why these mothers want somebody to look at their child. Then there's the duration issue. Um, huge mismatch between how long people thought the cough should last for and how long it actually did last for. This graph is people's expectations. Okay, so when people were asked, how long do you think this cough ought to last for? Um, and if you look at this, you see that the median duration they're expecting it to last for is five to seven days. So people expect themselves to be coughing for five to seven days. That's why they come and see us at 10 days. Okay, but actually a systematic review that looked at the duration of cough um, suggested that it was nearer 17.8 days. So a big mismatch between what is actually going to happen and what people expect. Previous experience is important. Previous experience of a, of a severe infection. Here's somebody who had a really a dramatic event, quite obviously, with their young child. I rushed him to the doctors. Apparently both his tonsils were, he was on antibiotics straight away. I felt dreadful. How did I miss that? And I think from then, I can't have him suffer again. You can hear the drama of that story. And then, of course, there's the story of what happened last time. 
of a previous prescription. Because obviously he sounded the same as what Aidan does. Sorry about that. Um, Aidan was a, the younger child, the younger sibling of the child. So when the older sibling started to cough, of course, and Aidan was given an antibiotic, then the expectation is that the other child needs an antibiotic as well. So that's training people, in a sense, to expect an antibiotic. And then there's our previous experience. You know, this myth of, you know, he'll need an antibiotic or he'll come back from, this is one of my senior partners used to say this to me, I'm the lowest antibiotic prescriber in my practice by quite a long way. Um, and one of my senior partners who gave an antibiotic probably before the patient had even said what was wrong with them, no, that's not fair, um, used to say to me, oh, they'll be back for their antibiotic next week. Have you heard that said? <laughs> yes. Okay, well, they won't. Um, actually, the opposite is true. Um, this is a prescription of, um, if you look here, you've got the number of um, antibiotics prescribed. So from the lowest antibiotic prescribers to the highest. And the proportion of consultations per thousand patients goes up. If you're a high antibiotics prescriber, you're training people to come back and see you again. Okay. If you're a low antibiotics prescriber, you can help people to learn when they don't need an antibiotic. Mind you, of course, the patients had the choice. People knew that if they came to see me, they'd get an explanation and some reassurance. They knew if they saw my senior partner, they'd get an antibiotic. So where the power lies is interesting. Um, there's a belief that antibiotics will help. This, now, this is some years ago now, 2007. Um, people thought antibiotics would help. People thought antibiotics were effective in treating viruses and they knew when they needed an antibiotic. Do you think that's changed <clears throat> over the years? Do you think people are less likely to think antibiotics will help now? Because I think they will. I mean, I, I've been in practice a long time um, and there was a time when I could expect people, a few of my patients to slam the door as they went out. Um, because I hadn't given them an antibiotic. Oh, I'll go and see somebody next door who will give me what I want. They did the same with sleeping tablets too. So, you know, it, it, that was, I think, a scenario I don't think I've seen for many, many years. People now are actually saying, I don't think it's an antibiotic he needs, but I want you to listen to his chest. I think there has been a change. It's not me that's achieved that change. It's the publicity. There is a sea change. Then there's this question of whether a virus is an infection. I, I alluded to it earlier. You know, it's just that I think you always like rule it out. In a way, I suppose it's not the same, it's not some infection that they're not having treated. Now, these people knew they got a viral condition. It's a virus. But infection is different. Infection is bacterial and that might need an antibiotic. Have you heard people say that sort of thing? I know it's a, I, know, I think it's probably only a virus, but I wanted to make sure I hadn't got an infection. And I very patiently think, now, shall I explain that a virus is an infection, but it's a viral infection? It's a bit of a mismatch in our understanding and the patients. <coughs> it became clear that they believed antibiotics treated more severe illness an infection, um, not because they thought antibiotics would treat viruses. Now, that's a misconception that maybe if we understand it's a misconception, we can do something about. <laughs> so, why do we prescribe? That's the why the patient comes to see us. Why do we prescribe? Well, there are features on the physical examination that are associated with the prescription. So, fever, purulent sputum, abnormal respiratory examination, all perfectly reasonable. If you remember my earlier slide about how do you pick up a pneumonia, Tonsillar exudate is an interesting one as well. Increase the odds of prescribing. So clinical features are driving some of our prescribing, and that's not unreasonable. Time, duration. It's been a couple of weeks and they think they know better. Then I might give a prescription, even if there was no overt sign, says this GP. When do people come and see us with their chesty cough? 10 days to two weeks. So that is enough, we are not appreciating as clinicians the duration of these coughs. Remember the natural history. 
Then there's our perception of what the patient wants. The patient's desire for an antibiotic, when the patients are asked, are you expecting an antibiotic? Is that what you want? Um, that response, the patients who wanted an antibiotic, that response was only loosely associated with whether they got an antibiotic or not. But what was very strongly associated was the physician's perception of whether the patient wanted an antibiotic, even if the patient didn't. Um, and this concept that, you know, the, you've, got to, so you've got to do something. They've come to bring your child to see you. They've got going on a holiday at the end of the week. Um, somehow you've got to do something. It seems to be what we're here to do. Our role is to help. And if you've had a complaint, it's a fact of life, isn't it? We get complaints. I've had a complaint because I didn't prescribe an antibiotic and that changed behaviour for the future. You don't want a complaint, even if you're right. I think we can all understand that. And then there's uncertainty, that needle in a haystack. It'd be nice to know that we were really sure we'd ruled out pneumonia, but it's not as easy as that. It's a clinical judgment. Often there isn't quite enough evidence to be absolutely sure. And in primary care, of course, that's where we are, isn't it? We can't necessarily do a chest X-ray instantly and rule something out. So what can we do in order to um, reduce our prescribing? Well, we can reduce the clinical uncertainty. You're all familiar with Centaur criteria that have been around for many years for di deciding whether somebody needs an antibiotic for their sore throat. Um, the four things, the, if you've got all four of these, then you are more likely to have a strep sore throat. That's tonsillar exudate, big glands, um, history of a fever, a high fever and the absence of a cough, interestingly here. Um, that's been updated now with the fever pain criteria. Are you all familiar with these? Yeah, okay, which one do you use? Fever, fever pain, which is very much the same, but attend rapidly. Um, that is important, people who are getting ill very rapidly. By the time they get to three days, um, if nothing's gone seriously wrong, it probably won't. So the person who turns up 10 days later is well outside that. Delayed prescribing. Who uses delayed prescribing? Yeah, okay. How do you do that? Do you give them a prescription and say, get it if you need it? Do you make them come back and pick it up from the desk? Who makes them come back and pick it up from the desk? Who gives them a prescription and says, take it if you need it? It's much easier, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Does it work? Okay, so compared to an immediate prescription, if you use the antibody, if you use delayed prescribing or don't give a prescription at all, okay, so those are the three options, either giving an immediate prescription, delayed prescribing or no um, prescribing, antibiotic goes down, use goes down if you use delayed prescribing, so not everybody goes and gets the prescription anyway, um, and no prescription, it goes down even more. Patient satisfaction, delayed prescribing, people are perfectly happy with, makes no difference to their satisfaction. Um, if you don't give a prescription, then there is a, a drop. It's not a huge drop, but there's a drop in, um, in satisfaction. And the control or, or the, the degree of symptom relief and complications, delayed prescribing makes no difference at all. There is a slight increase in um, if you don't give a prescription for slower recovery. Um, the problem is that the studies that went into this Cochrane review were very varied. So for the standard cold that you get, it actually made no difference. It was for certain specific tonsillitis, for example. There were certain specific conditions where there was um, an increased complication rate if you didn't prescribe. But it was small and it was only in some conditions and some studies. So there are different ways of doing that. Um, and I think probably most of us issue the prescription and say collect it if things aren't getting better. Now, CRP testing. I'm really interested that you're using CRP testing. Um, this is a, a very large um, cluster randomized controlled trial, GPs, which was conducted in the Netherlands, where they have a very similar uh, primary care system to us. And broadly speaking, the practices were in um, four groups. There were the ones who had the usual care, 
Then there was um, CRP testing, point of care testing, so it could be done at the point of the consultation. Consultation skills to enable people to um, counsel patients better, and then the combination. So you've got the four groups. And both those two interventions were effective. So doing the point of care testing, reduced antibiotic prescriptions, and skills training also improved the, um, reduced the antibiotic prescribing. If you put both together, the antibiotic prescribing went down from 67% down to 23%. Huge drop. Um, and in terms of patient recovery and satisfaction, there was no difference between the groups. This was for basically for upper respiratory tract infections. So really, it is possible. And that's why I'm so interested in CRP testing. Similar thing has been done in COPD. Um, CRP testing, point of care, actually manages to enable us to reduce the number of antibiotic prescriptions that we give to people with COPD exacerbations. And not only that, but the patients were not only had fewer antibiotics, but they got better quicker, probably because they didn't have the side effects. One in 13 people given an antibiotic will get a side effect. So actually, we were making people better quicker with fewer antibiotics. So I think CRP testing, if your practice happens to be very wealthy and wants to invest in something, that would be the one machine I would go for, I think, now. So just briefly some thoughts about consultation skills. A um, lot of information and data about this. First of all, listen to the patient's story. We're always told this. We always interrupt, apparently, before they finish the minute and a half it'll take them to tell the story. But listening to the story and working out why somebody has come to see you. <laughs> Examine them carefully because reassurance is what most people are consulting on. And that means getting a stethoscope out. It means taking enough clothes off that people think you've really listened to the chest uh, or looked in the ears or, or whatever. But it, that is what they've come to be reassured about. And ostentatiously listening to the chest, occasionally, I suppose, might come up with an abnormal sign. Normally it doesn't, but at least you're able to say, oh, well, that sounds perfect. You can almost hear the patient going, oh, good. Am I alone in thinking that? You've seen people actually respond in that way. Um, remember that viral equates to mild in people's minds and that bacterial means severe. So when we're talking to patients, remember that misconception, if you like, but the, the fact that we're probably talking at cross purposes. Then when you've made your mind up, you're not going to give an antibiotic. Start with an antibiotic won't help. I've listened to your chest, it's perfectly clear. The ears are fine, whatever. An antibiotic won't help. Okay. But it, almost immediately, in the same breath, follow it with, but this is what you can do to relieve some symptoms. Um, it seems that the combination is really important. Not you can't have an antibiotic go away, but antibiotics won't help, but this is what you can do. Some simple advice about keeping temperatures down, painkillers to relieve discomfort um, is important. Link the two. Given accurate prognosis, this is going to go on for another two to three weeks, not you'll be better in three or four days. Um, and safety net. I'd like to see you again if the following happen, so that people know that the door is open should it be necessary, which it isn't very often. Are you all doing that? But it's a helpful checklist, isn't it? To see it written out. And if you're going to remember anything, probably that sequence is the most important thing. Now, this is how I do it. Um, you have to imagine now that um, this is the counterfoil to a prescription. You know those white bits beside the green prescription? You know what I'm talking about, the counterfoil for a prescription? Um, and you have to imagine that the lines on the computer are actually my fountain pen. So what I do is I draw this timeline for people uh, like our gentleman who'd been coughing for 10 days. Um, and basically what it says is that the infection, the viral infection, is this first five days. Fever, sore throat, cold, feeling ill. That's the infection bit. And at the end of five days, your body has killed the infection off. That's why the fever goes down, why you're now feeling better. But it's not the end of the story. Because the cough, which actually doesn't start at the beginning, if it did, I'd be a bit worried as to why, it actually gets going during the course of that infection, 
And you've then got, it gets worse before it gets better. And in fact, it reaches a peak at about 10 to 14 days. And that's why people come in at 10 to 14 days. It's the clearing up afterwards. You've got a cough that's dreadful, but you're well. So you're well, the fever's gone, the sore throat's gone, but you're coughing madly. And in fact, everybody's saying, oh, that's a terrible cough. <laughs> and you can actually say, yes, I know, but I'm better, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, that is no longer an infection, that's why you're well, and it will gradually get better. Almost everybody will have stopped coughing by a month. And I draw this picture for people. They all go out with their little piece of white paper. With it. And I've actually had people say to me, oh, yes, I've still got it on my fridge. <laughs> um, but it explains the process. It also allows you to say, um, what can you do? Well, you can do some simple things. Cough medicines don't work. If they did, they'd be dangerous because you don't want to suppress a cough. If you've got some phlegm and stuff around, you need to put a cough it out. In the absence of an anaesthetist to suck it out, you need a cough reflex to get it out. Uh, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, Talk about painkillers, honey and lemon, simple things, avoiding cold air and talking. It's having a conversation that sets the cough off. So simple things that people can do to soothe the cough. And it also enables you to say, if you get a temperature again here, that's not what I'm expecting. If Luke gets a temperature and starts to go ill again, that's not what I'm expecting. Come and see me. And I want to have another look at his ears. So it enables you to safety net as well. So that's my trick. You will all have your own and I'd love to hear about them. Uh, avoid mixed messages is the final thing. Um, this issue of um, the fact that in a practice people can shop around. If you're going to really make a difference on antibiotic prescribing, I think we have to do it as a practice, not just as individuals. So, some final thoughts for you. Um, I hope this has been helpful. I'd be really interested in if anybody's got any suggestions or hints that might help that I hadn't thought of. Silence you all. <laughs> and it is nearly coffee time, but if anybody's got any hints they want to share with me about how they reduce their antibiotic prescribing. Tell me about your CRP testing. Um, so that we use it mostly to reassure patients yes. that they don't have. Sorry. <laughs> mostly to reassure patients that they don't have a serious um, chest infection or pneumonia yeah. rather than but you do occasionally get surprises when I think oh this isn't much and then the CRP is really high and you think oh perhaps they do need antibiotics <laughs> <laughs> so it reassures you and the patient any other hints tricks I just wanted to ask a question about the CRP testing does it impact much on the timing of your consultation at all or it takes about four or five minutes to do okay. so we're lucky we do have 15 minute appointments Oh, we'll all join you. <laughs> On the other hand, you would be saving, eventually, you'll train people not to come back. So there's potential savings. <laughs>